Our next speaker is a man who's been around these tracks many times. Actually, I have to confess, this was a, a young man I taught at school, can you believe? He was one of the most brilliant athletes I'd ever coached. Now he's running faster than he ever ran then, all over the countryside, arguing the case, and it was Drew who pioneered this initiative, Lock the Gate. I think he's going to take that argument a step further forward. Would you please enthusiastically welcome Drew Hutton. Thank you, Alan. I've got to admit, the hardest taskmaster I ever had was uh, my uh, tennis and athletics coach, Alan Jones. <laughs> but he was a wonderful coach. Um, yesterday, the leader of the LNP in Queensland, Campbell Newman, released his party's coal seam gas policy for the next election. That policy consisted basically of one line. He said, we will give extra compensation to people who've got coal seam gas on their properties. That was it. That was it. This man lives in a bubble. He doesn't understand, as I do, because I've spoken, uh, I lead an organisation that's got thousands of farmers in it, and I've spoken to thousands more. There wouldn't be more than a handful of people who've told me that their main problem with coal seam gas, and coal mining too if it comes to that, is that they're not getting enough compensation. Wouldn't be more than a handful of people. Most of them say they don't want this on their property because they regard themselves as stewards of the land. They're custodians. Now this man's going to lose the unlosable election. Nobody wants the Bly government back in Queensland. This man could just walk in if he was prepared to take up this most important issue that's going to confront the people of Queensland at the next state election. And what's he doing? He's saying, we're going to give them more compensation for having this on their property. What a foolish move. And we're going to make sure that the next election in Queensland, just as the next election in New South Wales and the next federal election, are going to be very much about responsible mining and protection of food security. Now we've got, in response to this immense tidal wave the mine, that has been presented to us by the mining resources boom, we've got thousands of landowners across Queensland and New South Wales, but increasingly in states like Victoria and Western Australia, they are locking their gates. This started in a little place on the Darling Downs. My, I had an office out there in uh, late 2010 an act of desperation on our part, we would call on landowners to refuse to negotiate access to mining companies coming on the land until there was a moratorium to make sure that this whole thing was safe environmentally and socially, until the proper protections were in place. Now that movement has spread and any political party that doesn't take that into account and support the quite reasonable demands that the Lock the Gate Alliance has put forward will suffer at the next election. Because the, what, what the Lock the Gate Alliance is doing is where we've taken a very conservative policy, a very conservative policy. We want to protect our water, we want, especially underground water. We want to protect our farmland. We want to protect people's health from mining. We want to protect important natural areas and, and important cultural heritage. We want to protect all those things. You couldn't get a more conservative policy if you tried. But our tactics are radical. Because we're taking up things that people like Gandhi have done in the past. And we're saying that when governments fail us, as they have on this issue, Ordinary people have got to step up and become heroes. We're going to create, we have created, the biggest, we're well, in the process of creating, the biggest social movement this country's ever seen. Now, 
What politics is all about, so the politicians tell us, and many people in the media tell us, is the art of the possible. Well, what we're doing in Lock the Gate is redefining the possible. We're saying, you might, people like Campbell Newman might live in this bubble where he thinks that politics is the art of the possible. We're changing the ground rules. We're saying that we're locking the gate on these companies until they have a social licence. Now, they're trying to buy their social licence. You know, the Santosses and the uh, BHPs and so on of this world, they're trying to buy a social licence. They'll pay some money to the local football club, or they'll pay some money uh, to the University of Queensland for a coal seam gas unit, which I'll bet's going to give them some independent research on, you know, like fun they will. They're buying the CSIRO. They're buying governments. But they're not earning their social licence. That's what you've got to do. You've got to earn a social licence. You can't buy it. So we're going to create this social movement that changes the reality for government. And we're locking the gate. Tens of thousands of landowners around this country have already done so. Now, I'm the president of the Lock the Gate Alliance. And I'm saying here today, announcing here today, that we're going to take that one step further. And I'm calling on all those groups, landowner groups, that are part of the Lock the Gate Alliance, whether they're part of the Lock the Gate Alliance or whether they're not, to now follow the lead that's been given to us by the Karuna Coal Action Group. We've got Tim Duddy from that group coming and speaking along here in a minute the lead that they've given us. If these companies, without a social licence, attempt to bring their infrastructure into a community, we will blockade them. Yeah. We will put farmers and landowners and environmentalists and anybody who wants to give support to those people, we will put them at the front gate. We will support the farmer at the front gate. And if those companies want to invoke their legal right to enter that land, they are going to have to arrest that farmer and the people supporting them. And the minute they do that, the people of this country will say that is intolerable. We're not going to accept that. And they've lost. We've won. That's what we're going to do. Now the first example, I think, could be a blind farmer called Ian Moore. He's got a property on the Hunter Valley. Ian's blind, but he's a, he's a great farmer. In fact, he's an award-winning farmer. Now, a company called New Coal has uh, an expiration license over his property. They got the expiration license because the Labor Minister at the time did a deal with one of his mates gave him the expiration permit without a tender and of course made a multi-millionaire out of his mate overnight and now that company wants to come onto Ian Moore's property and they've taken him to arbitration and the arbitrator, the, uh, uh, arbitrator said, no, no, you've got to let him on. So he's taken them to the Land and Environment Court. He's going to the Land and Environment Court in Singleton on the 28th and 29th of this month and if he loses in that court then they will move on his property. When he does, I'm going to be standing right next to Ian Moore, and I encourage as many people as possible to come and stand behind, beside Ian Moore and his wife Robin and anybody else from that area that can. Now, country people in Australia value respectability. They're law-abiding. They're polite. They're all of those things. And that makes them so such wonderful people. I come from the country myself. I actually come from a little place called Chinchilla, which is right in the centre of Gasland, Queensland, I might add now. Not the little place I grew up in. But country people are, you know, and, you know they, they really appreciate being respectable people who, ab who abide by the law. They don't use a lawyer if they go to sell some cattle to their neighbours. They just sell the cattle. They don't bring in a lawyer when there's some sort of agreement to be done. But these companies are taking advantage of that. 
They take advantage of the fact that um, country people are polite and respectable and so on. Because they're not. They will use all sorts of tactics to come out of that land. They'll take all sorts of tactics to get the landowner off the property. They'll use all sorts of tactics to get access and, and, and screw the farmer as much as they possibly can. So we have to fight back. Don't lose your politeness. Be strictly non-violent. Yeah, we'll, we'll have blockades and pickets with people serving cups of tea, like they did at, the, at Karuna. You know, polite, respectable people, but at the front gate saying, you're not coming on. Now, Ben Cubby in the Sydney Morning Herald the other day wrote an article um, in which he, um, he ended by saying that a petroleum expert at a conference recently said that they had, a, had this um, a project, development project in California, and they were having quite a lot of trouble from a, a campaign against them, and, uh, but they were, they were holding their ground they said, and, uh, but well, one day the actress Daryl Hannah appeared on the scene with a pink surfboard. And from that moment, they lost. They said, yeah, the pink surfboard just sank them. Now, of course, it wasn't the pink surfboard that sank them. It was the fact that thousands and thousands of people had been working for a long time on this issue. But the same thing will happen here. We've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are joining this campaign, working in this campaign, suffering in this campaign, at a certain point, that pink surfboard's going to turn up. And when it does, we've won, they've lost. Thank you.